If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, open, open your Bibles to Psalm 113. Psalm 113, as we continue looking at the Psalms. And I'll read the whole, the whole Psalm. Everybody notice what it starts with. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise, O oh, servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning <clears throat> in awe of your majesty. Your glory is above the earth and above all nations and above the heavens. You are seated in your sovereign throne and you rule and reign as you please. And we thank you, Lord, that you have made us, you have adopted us as your children through Jesus Christ, in which we can boldly enter the throne room of grace and find mercy and grace in time of need. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for us to gather as your people, as a church. Um, we pray that you would Convince us of your word, your truth. Convict us of our sinfulness and apply gospel balm to our souls. I pray for anyone in this room that does not know Christ, that today would be the day that they repent of their sins and look to the mercy and grace and salvation and redemption and forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, bless your word, I pray, and guide us as we go through this psalm of praise. You're worthy of our praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so again, the psalmist here begins with an exclamation to praise the Lord, right? It's sad that we need to be reminded to praise the Lord, but we do. Praise the Lord. He immediately, after this exclamation to praise the Lord, this burst into praise by the psalmist, he immediately gives us two commands. There's two commands here in verse <clears throat> 1. The first command is seen in, in B, verse 1B, which is praise, O servants of the Lord. The command to praise is directed to a qualified group. It's directed to a qualified group. We're told this qualified group is, are the servants of the Lord. Now, in Christ, as we read through the Gospels, what we see is the embodiment of servanthood. We see the embodiment of servanthood. He not only did he say, and not only did he do, that he said and told his disciples and told those that he came to do the will of his Father, to serve his Father's will. So he embodied servanthood by as Philippians 2 tells us, by leaving his throne and taking upon flesh and humbling himself 
taking the form of a servant and being obedient to the point of death. He embodied servanthood by serving the will of his Father, even as that will led him to the cross to drink every cup, every ounce of wrath deserved for his people. Something that words cannot put uh, meaning to, they cannot display the full picture of, we cannot fathom, nor can our minds imagine what Christ went through on the cross when he drank every ounce of wrath that his people deserved. And yet he walked willing, willingly to the cross because he embodied servanthood by, by serving the will of his Father. And by doing so, by serving the will of his Father, he also served for the benefit of his elect people. Think about that, dear Christian, that every benefit, every joy, every happiness, all that you have in Jesus, joint heirs, adoption into the family of God, all of it is because Christ was willing to be a servant to the will of his Father. And through that servanthood, all the benefits that we have are ours. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ because he embodied servanthood. You ever, maybe you've done this, maybe you've, maybe right now, or maybe at some point in your life you had a really, really great job. Some of you are saying, can't think of that. <laughs> Some of you say, yeah, I remember that. It's not the one I have now. But maybe if you've never had that kind of job, maybe you know someone who have. They come up to you and they're like, man, I've got the greatest job ever. It's like I'm not working. I've got the greatest boss, man. He's so good to his employees. We get this. We get that. We get the other. But what I get to do at work is fantastic. Man, I've got the greatest job in the world. And this person's bragging about all the benefits of their job. They're bragging about their boss. They're bragging about how they love their job. They're bragging about loving going to work. But dear Christian, think about this. We as Christians have been given the privilege of serving the Lord. And that calling, by the way, is higher and more grand than any other calling that we have in this life. It trumps our employment. Amen. And we have been granted this privilege and been brought into this relationship with God in which we are his servants. We get to serve the will of our Father. We get to serve the will of our Savior. We have been brought into, as Colossians says, we've been delivered from a bad boss and bad benefits and bad tasks and things that did not fulfill, nor did they make us happy. We've been delivered from that domain. Colossians, Paul calls it the domain of darkness. And we've been delivered into the kingdom of his son where nothing but blessings pour down upon us because of the king whom we serve. Amen. How grand is that? And yet we have to be reminded to praise the Lord. We have been brought into the king's castle to serve him. This, even in human kingdoms, this is a grand privilege. Typically, only nobility get to come into the castle. You have to have some title to your name in order for you to come in. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But we've been, we've been given the privilege of serving the Lord. We've been given the privileges of and the benefits 
of being a citizen of the kingdom of the King of Kings. And the beauty of serving the Lord, and this is most beautiful, and something we just continue to forget every day. The beauty of serving the Lord is that all we do to serve Him, and hear me, because this is the only place this is really true, all that we do to serve Him reciprocates into our eternal benefit. Think about that. All that we do to serve Him reciprocates into our benefit. He is not a taskmaster looking out for his own good. He looks to the good of his people. Our joy, our happiness, our unending pleasure, all are full and overflowing in the service of our King, the Lord. We we may not recognize that it's overflowing, but it is overflowing with benefits, dear friends. And joy is restored when we recognize that benefit. Praise is evoked when we recognize that benefit, that our cup, dear friends, is overflowing with joy and happiness and unending pleasure because we are servants of the King of Kings. And we need this reminder, a reminder of our role of servant before God. And that by and through serving him is how we actually find and experience what is best for us and what brings us the most joy. Too often we forget this, do we not? Too often we forget this. We forget that we're servants of the King of Kings and we forget the benefits that come and overflow because we're servants of the King of Kings, and we lose our joy. We lose our happiness. It's not that the joy is not there, and it's not that the happiness isn't there. It's just we're not experiencing it because we've got our eyes fixed on something else. And when we forget this, what we, what we often do and I would say almost always do or always do, is we try to take the role of director of our life. And when we take the role of director of our life, dear friends, we we get into a seriously tragic situation as it relates to God. Because when we take the role or we seek to take the role of director of our life, we start treating God as if he were a mere stagehand to our life that we are directing. We're not really praising the Lord anymore. We're beckoning him to meet our will. As if we're calling out to God, hurry up, get me that prop. I need that prop. We're in scene one, act two. I need that prop. I'm the director here. This is the life I want. I know what's best. Give me prop. That's really what our life turns out. Now, we wouldn't say that. We're too theological to say that. Our theology is too good to really say that out loud, but I'm saying it out loud because that's how we behave too often in our life. We want to be the director of our life. We doubt God really knows what's best for us. We we doubt that God's really directing us in the way that we think we should go. We plan our steps, and we want to direct them, rather than planning our steps and letting God direct them, right? And so we, we stop praising the Lord, and we start beckoning the Lord to give me the prop that I need for this scene to go just the way I've imagined this scene to go. And so we forget that God is the director of our life and we're the stagehands. 
We're the servants that are to follow his will, not him following ours. The, the psalmist here is reminding us of who is actually worthy of praise, who is actually the director and who is actually the one who serves the director. Praise the Lord, you blessed servants of the gracious Lord, is what he's saying. Praise the Lord, because you have a gracious Lord in whom you've been given the privilege to serve. The second command is praise the name of the Lord. We are directed to praise something specific, the name of the Lord, and the name used here is Yahweh. We're to praise the name of the Lord, and the name here is Yahweh, which is the name that God gave to Moses to tell the people who he is, the name that means I am, that I am, and that also means the one who was, who is, and who will always be. He is the sovereign Lord, as we read from Daniel 4, who does as he pleases in the heavens and on the earth, and no one can stay his hand. It's his name and no other that should be praised. And praise and worship are synonyms. He alone is worthy of our worship, dear friends. Worship is given to something that deserves our obedience. And obedience to one that trumps obedience to any other. And Yahweh is the only one who deserves our worship and our praise. And that's hard for us to, to grapple with daily, isn't it? If we're honest with ourselves, that's why Paul says, I, I die daily to myself. I, I have to die to self. Right, Because my natural propensity is to use everyone around me for the glory of Kent. And what we're called to do and what we're learning as Christians is how to relate to God differently, to relate to others differently, and to relate to his law differently. And so I learned to relate to others differently in that I'm not looking to you to glorify me. I'm looking for us to glorify God. Now, I'm glad you amen that, and I amen it too, but we also know how hard that is, do we not? That's a daily battle for every single one of us as Christians. We do not deserve worship, even though our flesh tells us every day when we wake up that we do. Our spouses do not deserve worship. Even though in the flesh our spouses would say they do. And I'm a spouse. I'm blaming myself. I'm not pointing the finger at my lovely wife. We're all spouses if we're married. Our children do not deserve our worship, although every day they would tell us they do. And listen, our flesh will trick us into thinking that's true. And here's how we know it's true. If we're disobeying God in that relationship, they have become worship for us. If we disobey God for a relationship, then that relationship has become our God. Our leaders in government do not deserve our worship. No one but Yahweh is worthy of our praise and worship. He is higher, listen, the psalmist is telling us, he is higher than all the nations. No one but Yahweh is worthy of our praise and worship and ultimate obedience. The next two verses which fit with these two commands are connected to the name Yahweh. It says in verse 2 through 3, and we're gonna, y'all are going to have to listen faster this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. We have these words that indicate unending time forevermore. Praise the Lord forevermore. He is the God who was and is and what? And is to come. Forever will be. Unending repetition of praise. In other words, 
The praise doesn't end. There's never a moment in time, whether it's past, present, or future, that he does not deserve our unending praise. <coughs> so the psalmist is beckoning the hearer to let your praise begin and never end. From this time forth and forevermore, let your praise be to the name of the Lord, for the name of the Lord. The word blessed here in verse 3 is different than the word blessed from Psalm 112 where it said blessed is the man. If you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. That word in Psalm 112 where it says blessed is the man, you remember that I summarized that. It has a lot of meaning, joy, contentment, happiness, um, generosity, all these things that Psalm 112 teaches us it means, but it really, you can summarize it by saying that word means that you're in a state of bliss. In the state of bliss is the man who fears the Lord and delights in his commandments. The word blessed here in Psalm 113 is a different word. So there's different meaning behind this word when it says blessed be the name of of the Lord behind this word or in the meaning of this word is the bending of the knee for blessing. That's what this mean this word means. Bending of the knee for blessing. So if we are blessed by worshiping the Lord, and the psalmist is saying, May our knee be bowed at the name of the Lord, the psalmist is telling us this at the thought of the name of the Lord and the mention of his name may worship and praise and adoration be evoked in our hearts. May God be worshipped in your heart at the name of the Lord. When you hear, when you think of the name of the Lord, what should happen is that praise should start bubbling over and overflowing in your heart. May our hearts kneel in worship at the thought of the Lord. The psalmist gives us a timeline here of praise for the Lord. He says, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. I want to say to those who, if you're here and you are not in Christ, let me say this to you, it's not too late. It's not too late. The psalmist says, from this time forth and forevermore, blessed be the name of the Lord. What all people need is to know God rightly, cry out for wisdom in order to, to know God rightly, ask God to reveal himself in true knowledge, and when wisdom arrives, the result will be that the name of the Lord will evoke worship. And if you are a Christian and have praised him, but have found yourself void of praise, then I would say start anew. Cry out to the Lord. Thank him for all that you have in Jesus Think about the gospel and the benefits that you have in Christ and pray that that evokes worship in your heart. We grow accustomed to think to things that are praiseworthy. If you remember from a couple of psalms ago, and we put on this entitled attitude, right? The director of our life, we're entitled to say, God, I need this. Act 2, scene 1, I need this. And we get this entitled attitude and those things that we see all the time become ordinary. And when I say ordinary, what I mean is they become, in our, in our minds and hearts, um, not worthy of praise. But the ordinary is just as majestic as the extra, extraordinary. Because when we think about it, for anything to exist, for anything to be sustained, for anything to be repetitious, like seasons and sunsets and sunrises 
and your lungs breathing and your eyes seeing and your voice working and your ears hearing, all these things are only because of a majestic God speaking them into existence. And the fact that we enjoy them every day does not make them any less worthy of praise. The psalmist continues, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. What what he's saying here is when you wake up until you go to sleep, you should be praising the Lord. When you wake up until the time you go to sleep, we should be praising the Lord. The most beneficial, and hear me on this, the most beneficial, worthy, joy-invoking thing that you can do today is to praise the Lord. I hear people all the time, I just want to be happy, but then praise the Lord. Do you believe that? Three of you. Do you believe that the most worthy, most joy-inducing, happiness-creating thing that you can do is to praise the Lord? Paul did. He said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything you do is to the glory of God. It's to be done to the glory of God. And that's not just a command, and and I think we need to understand this, that's not just a command for the glory of God. That is just as much a command for the benefit of the obedient. All of God's commands are meant to benefit us. They're not killjoy commands. They're joy-creating commands. They're joy-keeping commands. They're given to keep us, to blanket us, to envelop us into joy that never ends. So the greatest thing that we can do is to praise the Lord in whatever we're doing. The Lord's name, who He is, is to be praised. And we should marvel at God. I love starting here in verse 4. Listen to what the psalmist says. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? So we have this declaration, right? The Lord is high above the heavens. And his glory, or the Lord is high above all nations, excuse me, and his glory above the heavens. And then there's this rhetorical question given by the psalmist. Who is like our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? And so what we, what we get here is this, this transcendent picture of the holiness of God. Because it's a rhetorical question, the answer is obvious, is it not? Who is like our God? No one is like our God. There's none to compare. You can take all of creation and everything that exists outside of God and it pales in comparison to our God. And the psalmist is giving us the best picture he can of the comparison of God to the entirety of creation. He is high above all nations. The psalmist is not trying to give us God's location. This is not the psalmist giving us eye maps of where God is. That's not what he's doing. Well, if you're looking for God, what you have to do is you, first you go above the nations and then you go above all creation or the, the heavens, right? That's not what he's doing. What he's doing is he's painting a picture for us of the glory of God. Do you think the greatest kingdom that ever existed is glorious? Most do, and they travel the world to go see them. Well, let me tell you something. God's glory is so high above all those nations combined. 
Do you think the galaxies and the sun and the moon and the planets and the meteorites and all these things that you we look up through telescopes, powerful telescopes, we send satellites out to look at them and we marvel and we come up with movies about it. Do you think that's glorious? Of course you do. Well, let me tell you really where you should gaze. Not at the thing that was created, but the one who spoke and those things came into existence. His glory is above all the nations, and it's higher than all the heavens. He is the sovereign of the earth. He is the only creator, and all other things have been created by him. What power, what altogether otherness of God do we see God transcends the creation. I love the imagery here in the psalm where he says, Who is like our, the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down, right? He's looking far down. We have to get these real powerful telescopes to look far up. God's looking far down, and it's this picture of God's glory so high that he has to squint and stoop down just to see us. Kind of like us as we get older, trying to see an ant crawling on the ground. Right? I'm, I'm getting old. My, my vision is not what it was, and I'm, I'm suffering for it. One day I'm going to walk in here with glasses. I've already got them, but I don't wear them all the time. He is so much more glorious. Who else is like this? No one, dear friends. No one is like this. But now we have this very cool praise-invoking transition. The psalmist wants us to see how glorious and powerful God is. He's infinite in glory. He's infinite in wisdom. He's infinite in majesty. He's infinite in holiness. And then he draws us in. Because here, here's the thing. That kind, that kind of of attribute, that kind of character that we've just seen displayed in the psalm, here's what, we would, here's what we would conclude without the remainder of the psalm. Well, why would he ever have anything to do with us? Because we, experience tells us that those who are high and lofty have nothing to do with the lowly, right? Jesus tells us um, how the human humanity uses power and authority, right? They lord it. They use people below them to lift them higher. But how does God use his power? That's right. How does God use his power towards weaker vessels? How does God interact with those who are lesser than equal? Does he use his power to dominate, to degrade, to demean? How does such a glorious, majestic, powerful being as God use his power? And the human logic and philosophy would say, he wouldn't have anything to do with us, why would he? I mean, how many of us are going out hanging out with ants? talking to them, trying to be their friends. If you're doing that, please don't raise your hand. <laughs> None of us. But look at verse 7. Here's this holy, transcendent, magnificent, majestic God who speaks and things come into existence in order to obey his will. He's so high that he has to squint. And that's the best imagery we can have in, the, in, the, in a human language. He's squinting just to see us. Here's how he interacts with us. He raises the poor from the dust. All the kingdoms of the earth won't let anybody but nobility in the castle, but this God lifts the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He hears their cry. 
He sees their sorrow. He loves stooping down and looking at his creation and being present with them. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. What God does is he lifts us up from our horrific circumstances that we many times get ourselves into. And when we cry out to the Lord, he rescues us. He's not up in the ivory tower hoping that the peasants don't come near. He's coming down into the village of peasants and he's meeting our needs. Is he obligated? Is there benefit for him in doing such? Listen to what Job says, and I think this is important for us to understand. It's a doctrine that's not spoken of much. Job 35, 4 through 8, this is where the fourth friend, Elihu, comes along and he says, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I will answer you and your friends with you. Look at the heavens and see and behold the clouds which are higher than you. If you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness concerns a man like yourself and your righteousness a son of man. Elihu had heard enough. You're harming God. Come on, Job, your life, your sin, you must be sinning in some way that you're harming God. <clears throat> Job's friends, if you've read the book of Job, you realize that the first three friends were not real good friends in a time of need. <clears throat> They've been everything but help. And now Job is veering from truth because bad company corrupts good character. And what Elihu clarifies here is the absolute truth of God that what we do has no impact upon God whatsoever. God, and hear me on this, God is self-existent. Aseity is the correct doctrinal term. He is independent from all other things, all of creation. When we do right, it adds nothing to God. We, we need to understand that when we do right, it adds nothing to God. God is not benefited from it. When we sin, it takes away nothing from God. God is not diminished in the least by our transgressions. What we do impacts one another, but what creation does does not positively benefit or negative to negatively diminish God of anything. He is altogether self-existent, self-sustaining, and he is who he is in and of himself. And here's the thing, and this backs us up, the doctrine of immutability. God does not change, no matter what creation does. It's an important doctrine to understand. Lest we think somehow doing good, we have done favor towards God and He is now obligated to us. God is not obligated to us, dear friend. God stoops in grace and mercy and interacts with us in covenants because He's kind God and He wants to elevate us higher than we deserve. The beauty of this truth is that God gives to us. We benefit 
God does not. And here's the thing. In, in our sinfulness, we typically will not engage unless we see some benefit for us. You see how God is altogether different? We thought that He was like us, but we were wrong. He's altogether different. He's so gracious that when He comes down and He blesses us, there's no benefit to Him, but there's an enormous, immense benefit to us. The ultimate benefit to us is the cross where God's justice met God's love and unjust sinners become just in the eyes of God by faith alone in Christ alone. This is how, this is how low God will stoop in order to be a benefit to his people. The Son of God did not incarnate and did not walk to the cross because somehow God would be improved. He did so because his people would be blessed and would be benefited eternally by such an act. In Christ, we are fully forgiven. And we think about here in Psalm 113 the transcendence of such a magnificent, majestic, holy, omnipotent, sovereign God who is not obligated, dear friends, to interact with us, but because of his character and his grace and his mercy, he chooses to stoop down to the lowest and interact with us for our benefit. Now I'm going to tell you something. What's the end of Psalm 113 say? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Is that, is he not worthy? Is he not worthy of us being excited to say, praise the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us, Lord. You are so gracious. We, we are constantly doing to others in the hopes of reciprocating benefits. But you are not. You give because you're giving. You give of yourself so that we might benefit in that relationship, not because you do. You are who you are in and of yourself. You are self-existent. You are immutable. You do not change, and nothing can change you. Nothing can improve you. Nothing can diminish you. And yet, we can be improved, and you go to such great lengths to stoop down to benefit us. And the ultimate benefit that we have is found in Jesus Christ. And we praise you, Lord. Help us to be a people that quickly, quickly and often break out in praise at the name of the Lord. We love you and we thank you. We thank you for loving us first. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.